Hello, my name is Jake, and I'm one of the aircraft maintenance engineers at Seneca College. Today's video will be on the fuel system and all the related drains that are commonly asked about on private and commercial flight tests. Question number one, what type of fuel tanks do Seneca College's Cessna 172s have? Is it A, a removable aluminum tank, B, a removable bladder tank, C, an integral wing tank, or D, a Mary Poppins carpet bag tank? Seneca College's fleet of Cessna 172 fuel systems start with an integral fuel tank. This means that it is not a separate tank, but rather that it is made from taking a portion of the wing and sealing it up and making that sealed piece of the wing the actual tank. You can easily tell where the tank is by knocking on the wing. The normal part of the wing will have a hollow sound and the special fuel tank portion of the wing will have a dull or muted sound. Question number two. How many fuel drains are on a Seneca College Cessna 172? Is it A, four, one on each wing, one on the belly, and a fuel strainer. B, 10, four on each wing, one on the belly, and a fuel strainer. C, 13, five on each wing, two on the belly, and one for the fuel strainer. Or D, too darn many. Each wing tank features five fuel drains to account for different slopes the aircraft might be parked on. Early models of the 172 had removable fuel tanks that only had one drain. This older type of 172 is still very common at a lot of private flight schools. Question 3. How does the fuel go from the fuel tank to the fuel selector? Is it A, a line running down the rear door post, or B, a line running down the front door post, C, both A and B, or D, the fuel gets to the fuel selector using the principles of PFM. The fuel leaves the integral wing tank by two routes. One route goes down the aft door post and supplies the fuel system when the aircraft is in a nose up position, like during a climb. The other route goes down the forward door post and supplies the fuel system when the aircraft is in a nose down attitude, like when you are on approach to the airport. Each pair of fuel lines joins together under the floor into one line for the right wing tank and one line from the left wing tank. The two lines meet at the bottom center of the fuselage and go into the fuel selector. This location can be found on the bottom of the airplane by locating the central fuel drain point. Question number four. How does the fuel reservoir ensure the engine is supplied with fuel when the fuel selector is momentarily between detents? Is it A, it is a bladder tank and collapses a bit, B, it's an aluminum tank with an accumulator, C, it's an aluminum tank that has a vent line that goes back to the main tanks, or D, not sure but I know there's a unicorn involved somewhere. A single larger line leaves the fuel selector and goes to the reservoir tank. The small kidney shaped tank holds approximately one gallon. It is vented up to the main tanks so it can handle momentary interruptions in the fuel supply caused by the fuel selector being between detents. The reservoir tank has a drain located on the co-pilot side of the belly. From the reservoir tank, the fuel moves on to the electrically driven auxiliary fuel pump. The auxiliary fuel pump is located under the co-pilot's feet. It is used for priming the engine before starting and clearing any vapor lock in the fuel system. If the fuel pump happens to develop an internal leak, rather than spilling fuel inside the cockpit, the system has a drain tube to direct these internal uh, leaks safely overboard and under the belly of the airplane. 
This is also located on the co-pilot side of the belly. Next, the fuel goes to the firewall fuel shutoff valve. This is controlled by a red knob down by the fuel selector. Question 5. Why is the fuel shut off on the cabin side of the firewall? A. There is more space on the cabin side. B. It prevents vapor lock. C. It keeps the valve away from potential fires on the engine side. Or D. The Cessna engineers all got together and voted on it. The fuel shutoff valve stops the fuel on the cabin side of the firewall to stop fuel from getting to any potential fires on the engine side of the firewall. After passing through the firewall, the fuel gets to what Cessna calls the fuel strainer. Other manufacturers have different names for it. Beechcraft calls it a fuel bowl. Piper and many of the home belts call it a gascalator. Some people will refer, refer to it as the fuel filter. Whatever you call it, it does the same job. Question number six. What does a fuel strainer and a turbine sand separator have in common? A. They are both found on airplanes. B. They both involve air. C. They both use a sudden change in direction to separate out contaminants. Or D. I don't know, but it sounds like the start of a good joke. The fuel strainer is the last chance to remove water and contamination from the fuel system before it gets to the engine. It does this with gravity. The fuel comes into the strainer and goes down the outside of the bowl. At the bottom, it passes through a coarse screen into her center core area and rises back up to fuel the engine. The down and back up motion is key. The lighter fuel makes the corner easily, but the heavier water and dirt have difficulty making the corner and get trapped at the bottom, much like the sand separator on a turboprop engine. These contaminants will stay trapped until a fuel sample is taken from the strainer and the contaminants are washed out the bottom of, uh, with the fuel sample. A fuel line with an orange fire sleeve carries the fuel up to the engine driven fuel pump. Question number seven. There is one line going into the engine driven fuel pump and two lines coming out. What are the two lines for? Option A. One to power each of the Cessna 172's two engines. B. The green one is a fuel drain line. Or C, it's just there to confuse student pilots. If the engine-driven fuel pump should develop an internal leak, there is a drain system to carry the leaking fuel safely overboard through a green flexible drain line. If either of the airplane's two fuel pumps have fuel coming from their drain lines, the airplane should be grounded until maintenance has the opportunity to fix the pump. Do not go flying with a leaky pump. Fuel leaks of any kind are not allowed. The fuel continues on its journey down to the fuel injection servo. The POH calls it a fuel air control unit. It is sometimes called a fuel control unit, FCU. The fuel servo measures the air coming into the engine and through a mechanical linkage measures out or meters the correct amount of fuel to match the air. This metered fuel goes up to the fuel distribution manifold on top of the engine. This is another part with many names. You will hear it referred to as a fuel spider or a spider valve. The word manifold just means many going into one or one splitting into many. In this case, the fuel distribution manifold is taking the one fuel line and splitting it between the four cylinders. Question number eight. What are the extra two fuel lines coming out of the fuel distribution manifold for? Are they A, for cylinders five and six, or B, one is a fuel drain and the other powers a fuel pressure transducer for the fuel pressure gauge in the cockpit, 
or C, one is a drain and the other powers a fuel flow transducer turbine for the fuel flow gauge in the cockpit, or D, one is a drain and the other powers a fuel pressure transducer that then gets converted into a fuel flow reading on the cockpit gauge. The fuel distribution manifold also serves as a place that a line can be connected to for the fuel pressure transducer. In the round dial 172s it is actually measuring fuel pressure and converting that pressure to an approximation of fuel flow which is then displayed in the cockpit. The G1000 172s have a different system. They use a spinning turbine style fuel flow transducer before the fuel distribution manifold. The electrical pickup inside measures how fast the wheel is spinning and can then accurately display fuel flow in the cockpit. The fuel distribution manifold also has a drain line for any internal leaks. This drain line starts out as a black rubbery hose and switches to a very thin aluminum pipe where it sticks out the bottom of the cowl. The fuel continues on to the fuel injectors or fuel nozzles. The fuel injectors force the fuel through a small opening which atomizes the fuel into a spray. This spray of fuel mixes with the incoming air and prepares a charge of fuel and air that is ready to be taken into the cylinder through the intake valve. Question number 9. If a fuel injector happens to become blocked, which is an extremely rare occurrence, what would the fuel flow gauge indicate and what is really happening? Is it A, the fuel pressure would go up and the fuel flow gauge would go down, which is indicating properly? B, less fuel flow would result in less pressure and less fuel flow indicated in the cockpit? Or C, the fuel pressure would go up and the indicated fuel flow would go up even though the real fuel flow is actually lower. D. Who cares? Just get a G1000 system because they never lie about fuel flow. In the very rare instance that a fuel injector should become blocked, the fuel pressure will go higher which results in a higher fuel flow indicated. But in reality, only three cylinders are accepting fuel and the actual fuel flow would be lower. It is true that a G1000 system in the same situation would properly indicate the lower fuel flow. However, there are many more moving parts in the G1000 fuel flow measurement system that could result in a failure. So whether your system might lie to you or is more likely to fail, both systems have their drawbacks and advantages. If your engine hasn't started yet and you force fuel to the injectors with the electric aux pump for the purpose of priming, there is no air pressure yet in the cylinder head to mix with the fuel. The lack of air pressure allows the fuel to run backwards through the air system and collect at the bottom of the air scoop. It will then be drained out through the air intake scoop water drain line, which can be seen at the back of the cowl is a medium size aluminum line. This is the only place that is acceptable to have fuel come out and still go flying. The G1000 and round dial 172s have a nearly identical fuel system. The only real difference is that the G1000 aircraft have a fuel return line from the fuel injection servo or fuel air control unit back to the reservoir tank. On the round dial 172s, the port for the return line is simply capped. With or without the return line, the system seems to work perfectly. That covers most of the fuel system. For the purposes of a flight test, there are only two more drains. Question 10. What are the remaining two drains for? Are they A. They are both oil drains. B. They are both battery drains. C. They are both vacuum system drains. Or D. One is for the battery and one is for the crankcase breather. Of the two remaining lines, the large clear hose, sometimes stained black, is the battery vent. 
The battery vent line allows the pink flooded lead acid gill batteries found in some of our 172s to breathe as they charge and discharge. The purple Concorde batteries that are in the rest of our 172s are a sealed AGM or absorbed glass mat battery. This style of battery does not require a vent for breathing. They do have a temperature sensitive plug that melts if the battery happens to have an internal short and start to overheat. These internal shorts are extremely rare. I've only seen one in 12 years of working here. In the event of one of these extremely rare internal shorts, the temperature sensitive plug will melt and any pressure from the overheat will be allowed to vent overboard through the battery vent. The last drain is a large aluminum pipe. This is the vent for the crankcase breather. It keeps the pressure inside the engine the same as the pressure outside the engine to minimize the stress on the engine case. It is also where oil will come out if someone puts in too much oil. Unlike cars, airplanes are made of aluminum and don't require undercar oiling, so please don't overfill them. Thank you. I hope you found this video useful. If you did find it useful, please check out my other videos. Or stop by and ask some questions. Thanks.